Hey everybody, not sure if you can see me or not. I'm just getting set up right now. I am not sure if you can see me, but I hear a weird sound. Hmm. I run it. I run it. I run it. Run it. Do you hear that weird whistling sound? That weird whistling sound. Or is it just coming out of my computer? Or is it just coming out of my computer? Or is it just coming out of my computer? Or is it just coming out of my Okay, I am here and ready to go. So whatever questions you got. Okay, I hope the echo is gone. I did a few things and it should be gone by now. So let me know if it's still there and I'll try to fix it but otherwise i'm here with my carrot juice cheers to you all and ready to get started awesome echo and sound are gone perfect okay ron it it looks like it's just uh me and you right now so anything you got any questions you got let's get started <clears throat> hi shreya welcome Hi, Surya. Let's see who else is joining us. Aditi, hello there. Arnav, I'm doing okay. Crazy day today, but doing okay. There's Nidhi. Hi, Nidhi. Hey, everybody. So Nidhi is our mod. She's our moderator. So she is a former student who is an amazing unofficial TA who is here to uh, help us out. Hi, John. Hi, Soteria. Hi, Jasmita. Hello, Yeway. I'm so excited to see you all. Well, you know what I mean, not see. But I'm excited that you're here to join me. All right. So I want to apologize, first of all, because I got here later than I wanted to. So my apologies in case you were waiting for me. 
Hi, Abdullah. Abdullah, I think I met you today in Mr. Gan's class, right? <clears throat> Mr. Gan's fifth grade class. Hello, Ria. Welcome. <clears throat> Oh, thank you, Abdullah. Thank you. We just um, renovated our kitchen on our own uh, with the help of my awesome neighbor. So everything you're looking at has been done with these hands. <clears throat> All right. Who else is here? Karunia is here. Stefan's here. All right. Welcome, everybody. I would show you my dogs, but they are not here. You know what? Coda is down here. So we find out that the Coda is actually, uh, he has had this this thing on his face. He's been scratching a lot. So we put a cone on it for a little bit. And my wife took the Coda to the hospital, to the vet today, um, and found out that he's got a, an infection on his face. So they had to shave it off and he's got to go on antibiotics. And he's wearing this cone right now, which is uh, making him uh, seem super depressed. So I got Dakota hanging out with me down here. Hi, buddy. Uh, let's see. Yeah, cap and trade. Um, yes, Gondar. I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right, but yes, I did do the kitchen myself um, with the help of my neighbor. Uh, can you explain the three growths? What do you mean by that, Ronit? I can definitely explain, but... Like, Let's see. Slow and fast cycle feedback loop. Okay, <clears throat> so let's get started. So, cap and trade. Here's the deal with cap and trade. The way that it works is uh, corporations. The idea is that some some body, some government, puts limit puts a limit on how much corporations can emit uh, CO two, right, for carbon emissions. So, for example, they'll say here's the amount that you're allowed to emit. Um, we'll just call it points right now or tokens or whatever, just to keep it simple. So you're allowed to have, say, uh, 10 tokens of CO2, right? Make up whatever number. Um, and if I'm a company and I'm aware that that's how much I can emit, I'm going to probably play it safer and try to not emit as much. And let's say I only emit like eight, right? And now I have two leftover tokens. So what I could do potentially is I could take those tokens and go to another company who's already reached their max and I could be like, here, I got two tokens for you. Do you want these? I will sell them to you. And that company will give me money for my tokens or for my credits or my points. And so that's, that's how it works. So there's a cap. So the 10 is that number that we talked about. That's your cap and trade. So you can trade it for, uh, for money. So it gives companies and corporations an incentive to not emit as much CO2. That's the idea behind it. Okay, Surya, I hope that makes sense. Um, the three growths are running. I'm going to come back to that one because I'm not sure what you mean. Um, talk about more slow and fast cycles. Yes, I will talk about the fast and slow cycles. Okay, so um, the fast and slow cycle of carbon. So here's how it works. So think of it this way, carbon, the carbon cycle right? It's this big umbrella, and then it gets divided up into two cycles. We have the fast cycle and the slow cycle. The fast cycle is known as the biological cycle. The slow cycle is known as the geological cycle. The fast cycle is stuff that, um, let's, let's actually back up and go to the slow cycle. The slow cycle is a cycle that takes a long time. By a long time, I mean millions of years, like 100, 200 million years. And it's basically this process of carbon working its way, cycling its way through the system where it's it's going down into, into our planet and it's eventually going to form into fossil fuels. And then eventually it's going to be brought up by volcanoes and then come back down again and go through that whole process. That takes a long time. That's the slow cycle. Then we have the fast cycle, which is uh, plants and organisms, animals, basically breathing. It's um, ocean waters taking in carbon. So stuff that doesn't take millions of years, it takes much less time, um, say months to years. So our fast cycle and our slow cycle, you want them to be in balance. You want the fast cycle to be going fast like the, like the way it is, the slow cycle to be going slow like the way it is. What we're doing as humans, we are taking carbon out of the slow cycle. So we're taking fossil fuels that took millions of years to 
to basically build up and we are dumping it into the fat cycle. We're burning those fossil fuels, right? And all of that carbon, all that extra CO2 is going up into the uh, atmosphere. So the fat cycle is not able to keep up with what we're giving it, right? So it's like a washing machine. If you have a washing machine and you put too much of a load in it, it's eventually gonna kind of crap out. So that's what's happening with the fat cycle. So all of that extra load, all that extra stuff we're giving it, it can't handle it. So it's basically pushing it into the atmosphere and it's thickening that layer around the planet. So that is my explanation of fast and slow cycle. I hope that's helpful. I know Ms. Uh, Detmer did a really nice job of that too. Um, Saivi, I met you today too. Hello, feedback loop. So I'm gonna come back to this one because it's not something that I'm covering on the test. So I'll come back. If it's something that, uh, I guess I'll just come back to it towards the end. Um, we got Dina. Hi, Dina. You're from his learners class, but is it okay if I ask questions? Of course it is okay if you ask questions. I'm glad you're here, Dina. Uh, Jasmita, what is the difference between a non-renewable and renewable resource? Okay, Jasmita. So here's the deal. By the way, I want to make sure I announce this again. So everybody who's joining us, uh, Nidhi, who is an amazing former student of mine, she is our moderator. So... Um, if there are questions that get asked the second time and whatnot, uh, she will step in and, and try to help you out. Okay, so going back to Jasmita's question, difference between a non-renewable and renewable resource. So a renewable resource is something that is in a cycle and it's constantly going to be renewed, right? For lack of a better word, like sustainable. It's, it's always, always going to be around. Non-renewable means that we can't necessarily replace it. So... The question comes down to water. Is it renewable or is it non-renewable? So when you think about the water cycle, the natural water cycle, it's constantly going in the cycle of evaporation slash transpiration, condensation, precipitation, and so on and so forth. And it's constantly in the cycle. Uh, so you would think that water is renewable, right? Because it, there's this natural water cycle that existed even before us, and it's always going to exist. So that's true. However, with everything that we're doing with climate change, or excuse me, with, with our carbon emissions, which is then causing global warming, which is then causing climate change, which is then causing things like droughts in California. With all of that, it's actually shifting weather patterns. So it's shifting the way that um, cl our climate is, is impacted. So to have a drought four, five, six, seven years, that's a long time, right? And so you think about Will we get the amount of water that we used to get uh, in regards to precipitation? We haven't. I mean, a couple of years ago, we had a crazy storm. Um, last year, we got a decent amount of rain, but prior to that, we had gotten, we had gone several years of uh, a drought. So uh, it really comes down to water itself being renewable, but drinkable water or fresh water not necessarily being renewable. There's no guarantee that we're always gonna have it. And a lot of that has to do with climate change. Cool, Jasmita. Aditi, what happens to carbon when it's dissolved in water? So when carbon's in water, it turns into carbonic acid. So it's the same thing in our blood. So when you mix carbon with water, you get carbonic acid. So let's talk about what happens. This is a couple important things. And we had this in our Kahoot today. <clears throat> and I noticed most of you got it, but a couple people missed it. So let's go over it. So when you have carbon in water, one of the things that happens is there's a correlation between carbon and temperature. So when you have carbonic acid in water, it's actually gonna push up the temperature. So temperature is gonna go up, but something else is gonna come down and that's pH. So when you have carbon or carbonic acid, acid in water, your the pH of that water is gonna become more acidic. So think about a pH scale, right? Up to 14, seven is neutral. Um, and it's, it's gonna go below that. So what you don't want is water that's super, water that's warmer than it should be because it makes it less livable for organisms and water that's more acidic than it should be because for the same reason. Okay, Jasmita, I hope that helps. Or excuse me, Aditi, not Jasmita. Um, thank you, Gondar, thank you very much. I appreciate the compliment on the kitchen. Um, Thank you. It, it, we put a lot of work into it. To be honest, it was it basically was my whole summer. So I started the school year not really feeling super refreshed because our entire summer, like I was getting up every day at like six or seven working on the kitchen. And yeah, 
So it was worth it, but it basically meant giving up about three months and not doing much. So <laughs> I'm glad that it um, that it looks nice. It, it makes it seem worth it. All right, Shreya, can you explain the difference between the parts of the carbon cycle? Shreya, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean fast and slow? If so, um, I am going to have you, I don't know, is there any way for you all to kind of, as you're watching this live, to be able to back it up and, and watch it from a like an earlier part? Or do you need to wait until it's over to be able to do that? I don't know the answer to that. Nidhi, what is the answer to that? I don't know. Okay, uh, let's see. Karunia, what's the difference between logistic graph and exponential graph? And looks like Ronit has the same question. Okay, I'm going to try to do this with my hands. I think I do have a board somewhere that I can go grab. But basically, an exponential graph is when you see numbers just kind of um, it's shooting up, right? Like when you look at the human population graph, it's been about 130 years that we've gone from, what is it? I think 1 billion to uh, over 7. So it's just shooting up like crazy. That's an exponential graph, right? And a logistic graph is if at some point that exponential graph starts to level off, and it starts to kind of do this. So in the situation, in our case with human population, right now we're looking at an exponential graph. We're not looking at a logistic graph yet, but it's most likely going to down the road when you kind of look at a big picture, it's gonna look much more like a logistic graph than an exponential graph. Okay, let me change the camera just a little bit. All right. I want to make sure you are able to see my hand gestures. All right, let's see. Jasmita, explain the difference between cell respiration and photosynthesis. Sure, Jasmita. Okay, so photosynthesis um, is, let me actually scroll down real quick to see. Uh, thank you, Nidhi. Thank you for reminding Shreya, Shreya to look back, or Shreya to look back. Um, okay. You can back it up. Thanks, John. I did not know that. So it sounds like you can back up the video to a part where I already talked about it. Cool. Thank you, Nidhi. Thank you for helping out. And thank you, John, as well. Okay, I'm going to scroll up to see uh, what the question was. Okay, yeah, Jasmita. Cell respiration and photosynthesis. Okay, photosynthesis is uh, a plant's ability to take uh, water, sunlight, CO2, and be able to make glucose out of it. And then that same plant could do cell respiration. So now it's taking the glucose, it's breaking it down to convert it into energy. So in our case, since we can't do photosynthesis, when we eat, our body does cell respiration. So you take that food you've eaten, you break it down into small molecules, right? You break it down into glucose, and then you convert that. Um, when you break glucose, you're actually releasing energy. So that is the difference. Uh, Michael, hi, Michael. Explain the difference between metabolism versus homeostasis. Sure, I can. Let me just get a quick sip of my carrot juice. So metabolism versus homeostasis metabolism is basically what we just talked about cell respiration right so uh it's your body's ability to be able to um just break down materials and convert it into energy and i hear coda snoring right now if you hear snoring it's dakota uh whereas homeostasis is uh the ability to be able to maintain a stable internal environment so an example that i've given in class recently is uh, so like when you eat, like when you eat dinner tonight, if you haven't had dinner already, when you eat dinner, uh, you eat all that food and then your body is going to break all that food down, metabolism or cell respiration. It's going to break it down into small molecules like glucose and then that glucose gets sort of thrown in your blood and now you have blood sugar. Your blood sugar is starting to go up, right? Your blood sugar can't stay that high forever. Your body actually manages it and brings it down. It's like, nope, come on down. And then you go to bed and you wake up in the morning and maybe you haven't had breakfast yet and then it gets to be around lunchtime and you start to feel kind of headachy and you're like, what's going on? Why do I feel this way? It's because your blood sugar is dropping and your body's like, nope, come on back up. So your body basically has ways of maintaining that internal uh, balance. That's, that's really what homeostasis is all about. 
Okay. Abdullah, what are the effects of photosynthesis, glucose, oxygen? Abdullah, what do you mean by effects? Uh, there's reaction and there's products, right? So uh, the, re the reactants um, in there are going to be water. They're going to be uh, CO2. You're going to need sunlight. And then out of that, what do you get? Out of that, you're going to get oxygen and you're going to get glucose. So that's how you want to think about it. John, the greenhouse called ecology resources is something about uh, geoengineering and nuclear vision. Do we have? No, John, you don't have to know that at all. We didn't even have time to get to it, so don't worry about that at all. Can the fast cycle, Viba, can the fast cycle natural? What do you mean by that, Viba? Can you, uh, can you be more specific, please? Shriya, hi, Shriya. Shriya, can you explain the process of cap and trade? Shriya, I explained that a little earlier in the video, so back it up. I think it's the very first thing I talked about, so back the video up and you'll be able to find it. Hi, Soteria. What's the difference between cell respiration and respiration? So, Soteria, um, in, in biology, we are always going to refer to uh, metabolism as cell respiration. Um, so, respiration on its own can also mean breathing, but I'm not going to be talking about respiration in those terms. I'm always going to refer to it as cell respiration. Okay? So, for the case of Say like this upcoming exam, if you just write CR, I'll know you're talking about cellular respiration. So don't worry about just the term respiration. So cell respiration has to do with your body basically breaking things down and converting it into energy. All right. Let's see what else. Surya, what is photosynthesis? Surya, I just covered that. I think you probably heard me. Uh, where does water from our tap come from? Ron, where does the water from our tap come from? Great question. So the water from our tap has... Uh, if you were to trace it back, you know, like become a little tiny whatever and like work it back from your house, you go into these water pipes, small water pipes, and that traces it all the way back to the water treatment plant. From there, there's lots of different places that it could have come from. In our case, it's coming from a few local sources and it's coming from the Sierras. So it could be coming from reservoirs. It could be coming from uh, snow that melted in the Sierras and then eventually gathered somewhere and then came to us. So lots of different places. I hope that helps. Remember, it never comes from the SF estuary. That's something that I saw a few students write. Um, and I just want to make sure I clarify that we never get our water from the estuary. That'd be a bad idea. Also, just a quick reminder, a little side note, because I like side notes. Uh, the mix of fresh water and salt water, anyone know what that's called? Brackish. Brackish water. All right. Can you explain what tar sands are? Sure, Shriya. So, Shriya, tar sands, are, it's basically this area in Canada where um, you have, so the, the soil uh, where the trees are growing in this, like, awesome forest, the soil is super rich, and when you try to um, when you try to actually take that soil and process it, it gives you this like really rich oil that we can use. And so the the way to access that soil is by cutting down the trees that are in the area. Um, it's I don't think it's very smart at all. I think it's damaging our planet. I think it's costly. There's just a lot wrong with it but it's an area that's got really rich soil. So if you think about it that way, I think it'll it'll help. Um, Gandhar, you are awesome. So, so awesome. Ronit, why is drinking three or four store-bought wa bottles of water a day not good? And why should you, with someone doing a chair? Well, okay, here's the thing. So store-bought water bottles. You have to think, again, trace it back. Where does that water bottle come from? First of all, it takes water to make that bottle, that plastic bottle. Uh, besides that, the water that water bottle companies have, um, that water, you don't know where it came from. Like one of the companies we talked about in class was Nestle. And Nestle actually does really messed up stuff where they'll, they'll go somewhere, um, wherever around the world, they can buy cheap land that has an aquifer and they'll tap into the aquifer. They'll make it inaccessible to the natives of that area or they'll charge them a ton of money for it. Uh, and the regulations for uh, water bottle companies aren't a whole lot. There's actually much more regulations on tap water than there is on uh, bottled water. So it's a couple of reasons for you. Gondor, yep, yep, three months, Gondor, three months of working on this kitchen. Nidhi, Abdullah, John, okay, Nidhi, Gondor. Oh, lost it. Let me go back and see if I can find it. 
I scroll down too much, you guys. Too much. Give me one moment and I will get caught up. Gondar, you did the floor of the garage by yourselves? Wow, that is impressive. I don't even know how to do that. Uh, that's awesome, though. It's kind of cool learning that stuff, isn't it? It's like it's a pain in the butt when you're doing it. And there are times that I'm like, why am I doing this? But it's it's really cool learning stuff and being able to apply it again. So now I'm like, I can help people with stuff that I used to not be able to, and that makes me happy. Arnav, when talking about biotic and abiotic, if something comes from a living thing, then is it considered living? Okay, Arnav, I think that starting next year, I don't even want to refer to it as that because it just confuses students so much overall when we talk about biotic versus abiotic and like is... For example, is a feather biotic or abiotic, right? We know it came from a living thing, so it's biotic. Uh, or things like dog poop or a bone of an animal that you find somewhere. It's biotic because it came from a living thing. I think I want to stop referring to, it, referring to it as that. I think moving forward, I just want us to apply the eight characteristics of life. So if you see something on your upcoming test, it'll just be about like apply the eight characteristic, characteristics um, and... Let's and go from there, and that'll be enough. Hi, Kuchuk. You all hear Kuchuk drinking water? Kuchuk's also on antibiotics. Both my dogs are on antibiotics right now. Kuchuk had a bladder infection, and we found out because she started peeing in the house, which is no good. But no more peeing, huh, Kuchuk? No more peeing in the house. Okay. Um, what is a watershed? Surya. So yeah, watershed is an area where you have, so think of like a hilly mountainous area where it there's precipitation, all this water is coming down. And basically that water is, gravity is taking it into this one given area where all the water is being collected. So what we do as humans is we find out what areas those are and we don't let that water escape by building a wall known as a dam in that area and that turns into a reservoir. Okay, um, Ronit, what is the correct way to calculate population density? Ronit, I don't have that paper in front of me, um, but I will tell you this too. I won't have you calculate any population density on the test, so don't worry about that. Can you explain what tar sands are, Shri? Uh, I explained that one, Shreya, so back up and you'll find that one. Explain ocean acidification. Hi, Shreya. Shreya, whose class are you in? Did you already tell me that? Uh, ocean acidification, Shreya, is when I briefly explained it before. It's when you have water that mixes, basically CO2 that mixes in with water, and that makes the ocean water or the water in any area where you have CO2, it makes it much more acidic. It brings down the pH of that water. Um, and that, uh, the results of that could be pretty bad where you have the species that are living there and they're just not, not digging it and they're dying. All right. Thank you, Nidhi. Thank you for helping me out. Uh, Gondar, during the waterway section, we did the survey to find out how much water we use per day and whether we eat meat or not. Change the amount of water by a lot. Why such a large difference? Okay, let me, let me make sure I understand that correctly. Oh, okay, okay. So, so Gondar, I think you're saying that for people like me, who are not vegetarians, people who eat meat, uh, what, why does that make your water footprint so much bigger? I think that's what you mean. So uh, the reason for that, Gondar, is because of the amount of water that it takes to actually grow livestock. So you think about just one cow, right? And think about how much meat we eat. I forget what the number is, but it's, it's up there, uh, especially in the US. The amount of meat we eat is ridiculously high. And in order for us to have that meat, cows, chicken, like everything, they all require water. Think about just how much water like we need on any given day, right? By the way, if you don't know, you take your weight, you divide it by two, and that's how many ounces of water you're supposed to drink every day. So anyway, so that's the reason, Gondar, because it takes a ton of water to, um, to be able to grow livestock and think about how long it takes, right? So if you want a cow that's, say, like three years, three years old, that's three years of giving it water until it can get to the size that it is so we can eat it. All right. Arjun, thanks for letting me know you can go back. Can I explain population density? Um, Jenna, I can come back to that one, population density, but to be honest, I didn't focus on it a whole lot for the test, almost at all. 
So there was other stuff that I really wanted to focus on. I feel like we barely spent any time on population density, and I didn't want to overwhelm you by giving you questions that I didn't have time to talk about in class. Ron, can you elaborate on overconsumption and overharvesting? Sure. Okay. So overconsumption is basically that video we watched in class. Um, it was the, what was it called? Story of stuff. So that's this whole idea of like, we're just consuming so much just as, as consumers or um, it's like whatever, just think about the amount of things that we are using and what we constantly want and how much we want to replace our stuff. Over harvesting is that same thing. So think about the amount of fish, for example, like we actually have to, in parts of the world, we actually have to tell fishermen like or companies like, hey, you can't fish here during certain seasons anymore or during certain months or whatever, because they just go out there, they cast these super like huge nets and they bring in so much fish and they're not thinking about making it sustainable, right? So they're like, it's just all this stuff that we are doing that's awesome right now, but it's not setting us up for success down the road. Hope that helps, Ron. At Arjun, Arjun, thank you for saying thank you to Nidhi. Nidhi is pretty awesome for doing this. Stefan, is this right? The amount of CO two decreases during the warm seasons and increases during the cold seasons. Okay, so think about this uh, during your warm season, so spring and summer. That's when you have a ton of um, trees and leaves, right? There's a lot of photosynthesis being done. Whereas in the cold seasons, you don't have as much tree, as much leaves because a lot of these trees end up shedding their leaves. So think about how there's one part of the year, if you were to really divide it, cut it in half, divide it by two, you have one part of the year where you have uh, a lot of photosynthesis being done, another part of the year where you don't have as much being done. So that part, it's kind of like our planet breathing. So it's constantly sort of inhaling and exhaling. So what I'm trying to get at with in your situation, Stefan, with what your question is, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah, you could say the level of CO2 would increase during the cold seasons and decrease during the warm seasons. Yep, you would be correct. Abdullah, what is produced? Oh man, Abdullah, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. I can come back and Abdullah, can you list your question for me again? Like. Give me a full sentence of it so I can read the whole thing and get back to you. Um, unless I answered it already. The CO2, so Shivani. Hi, Shivani. The CO2 in the ocean increase water temperature worldwide. Um, yeah, so Shivani, I, I answered this one, so go back and you'll be able to find this one. No problem, Soteria. Abdullah, what type of ecosystem is SF Bay? Uh, SF Bay is going to be an estuary. And I've told my students this. It shouldn't be called the SF Bay. It is an estuary. It is not a bay. All right. I had to get that off my chest. Thank you for listening. All right. Uh, let's see. Viba, can the fast cycle? Oh, okay. So Viba, the fast cycle is not natural. I was going to say natural. It's natural. It does not exist because of us. Both fast cycle and slow cycle exist regardless of us. It's just that we as humans are like, hey, let's do something messed up. We're going to take the parts of the slow cycle and dump it in the fast one because we're trying to do stuff like drive cars. And we don't want to use um, sustainable energy or renewable energy. Okay. Nitty. Yep. Thanks, Nitty. Run it. Something to know. You can click the three little dots vertically arranged at the top of the left chat box. You can actually see. Oh, really? I didn't know that, Run it. So apparently you can click the three little dots. Let's see, vertically and arrange at the top of there. You can actually see what time the video question was asked. That is amazing. I didn't know that. I'm gonna have to check that out. Cool, that's good to know. Jasmita, can you explain the difference between biomagnification and bioaccumulation? For sure, Jasmita. Biomagnification is this uh, concept of a toxin basically running, its not running its way. It's basically working its way through a system. So, you have a producer that basically takes it up, takes up the toxin, and then the primary consumer eats the producer. It gets less energy, right, because of the 10% rule, but it gets the same amount of toxin. And then the secondary consumer eats the primary consumer. And again, it gets only 10% of the energy, but all the toxin. And this just keeps happening through a system. And that is called biomagnification because that toxin is magnifying as it's working its way up. Whereas uh, with bioaccumulation, 
um, it really has to do with the fact that each organism doesn't just eat a couple things. Each organism doesn't just eat one other organism. So really over time, it's accumulating the level of toxin that it has in its fatty tissue. So you can, you can bring that time aspect into it and the fact that it's not just eating, it's not just a food chain, right? We're talking about a food web. So it's eating a lot of things in that system that uh, have the toxin. Abdullah, describe the salinity of the SF Bay. Abdullah, it's basically brackish, right? So San Francisco estuary has some fresh water, some salt water. I and mean, when, when you mix those two, you get brackish water. Ooh, thanks, John. You answered it. Oh, no. I, what is up with me scrolling all messed up today? All right, I'm going to try to find it. Yep. Things. Yeah, Ronit, thank you. And Nidhi, thank you also. By the way, Nidhi, it's 647. I know that I told you that I would go till 7, but I got here late, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. So Nidhi, you, I know you got things to do also, so if you need to leave, no worries at all. You can leave. <clears throat> Dina, what are ecosystem services and what's an example of them? Dina, I'll come, I'll come back to that one because um, it's not something that I focus on a whole lot on my test. Shreya, what is calcium carbonate and how is it formed? Shreya, you don't have to know much about that, honestly. I just really wanted to let you know that uh, when you have uh, a lot of CO2 um, in water, that can actually really impact shell formation, like eggshells. Um, or calcium carbonate is basically something that, yeah, I would, don't worry so much about it because I worry if I dive into detail, we're digressing and it's not stuff that you need to worry about right now. If you do want to learn more about it just because you're interested, let's definitely chat in person. I'm happy to teach you more about it. Gondar, yeah, Gondar, it is satisfying when you're done. I totally agree, especially because my family was here this weekend and we got to cook in the kitchen together and do stuff and I was like, cool, this was all worth it. But I think, you know what I realized, Gondar, I think this whole process of doing my kitchen and I don't think this is a good thing. I sometimes can be very result oriented, you know, like when they say, enjoy the journey, I'm trying to work more on enjoying the journey instead of just looking forward to the end result. One of my goals. All right. Hold on one sec. I'm going to do a couple things. I want to make sure that I'm writing a couple notes for myself so that I can answer some of the questions that I am skipping. Okay. All right. Let's see. Where were we? <clears throat> Arnav, is melted snow, mountain snow drinkable? If so, how does it make way to our house yeah yeah i guess you could drink it um but it's basically gonna melt and then go into rivers and then that's gonna go into a watershed into a reservoir and then it's collected and then it's transferred to water treatment plants um, through aqueducts and then gets to our house hi arushi drink cell respiration house co2 release arushi so this so we're gonna focus like super specific on CO2 and it's released during cell respiration and that's part of our next unit. So we're not going to talk about it a whole lot now. It's not something that I cover at all as far as like those specifics on this upcoming test. So um, so hold that thought, I guess. I'm not sure uh, if, Arushi, I think you have missed again if I'm not mistaken. So I don't think that you need to worry about that. Viba, is there a way to easily remember the characteristics of life? Viba, I don't know of a way to easily remember it, but if you do come up with a way or if anybody does have a way, I would love to learn it as well so that I can teach it to students um, in the future. Cool. All right. What else? What else? What else? Oh, excuse me, everybody. Give me one second. <clears throat> Getting a phone call from my wife. Excuse me. Hi, hon. All right, that's great news. Yes. Sounds good. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, it's okay. No worries. Okay, bye. All right, so sounds like Kuchuk no longer has a bladder infection. The vet just called and said, we are good. They called my wife and told her that we're good. So that is exciting news, everybody. No more peeing in the house. All right, let's see. 
Uh, Shreya, you're in Mr. Gan's class. Shreya, did we meet already? I know I subbed for Mr. Gan uh, yesterday and today. I wonder if we met. Yeah, Nidhi, you're thinking just memorize them as best as you can. Gondar. Okay, yeah, no problem, Gondar. Ron, is, is your carbon footprint how much carbon you emit on the planet? Yep, that's correct, Ron. It. So it's like um, how much you drive and you know the electricity that you have on, like all the things that you do where that energy is coming from fossil fuels. That's your carbon footprint. Let's see. Um, hi, Connor. Why is methane not dissolvable in water? Ooh, I don't know why methane is not dissolvable in water, but... Um, let me add that to my notes. I don't know. Great question. Hold on one sec. I can't tap today. Actually, I can try to look it up too. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so here's what I got right now regarding that question. Um, because methane is a gas, oh, it has. It comes down to chemistry. So the hydrogen bonds. So in order for them to dissolve, the methane would have to break the hydrogen bonds for water, which is just not going to happen. That's what I'm reading. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's what I got. All right, Shriya, can you explain what permafrost is? Shriya, permafrost is permanently frozen soil. So, and it's a place where carbon is stored long term. Dina, how can I differentiate positive and negative feedback loops? Yeah, Dina, so you're asking amazing questions, and I do want to come back and answer these, but um, I didn't cover these. We didn't have time to cover these, so I'm trying to make notes positive and negative feedback loops. Um, and then, Dina, do me a favor, actually. Um, I didn't cover these. I may not actually end up going over them, but I would love to help you out. So send me an email, um, puya underscore hajarian at fuhsc.org, and I will uh, help you out. I'll give you all the information and all the resources that I have so that I can hopefully help you. Okay. Ronit, will there be CER questions on the test? So Ronit, the only CER question that you should be uh, aware of is one of the one of the A-level questions, which we may put on the test. Remember, there are five A-level questions, uh, and two of those will be on the test. And then you get to answer one of them of your choice. Hi, Miranda. Will forestation release carbon? Yeah, deforestation. Yes, deforestation will release carbon. If it's in the form of burning trees, then it's going to release it into the atmosphere. If it's if you're cutting down trees, then it's going to, and you leave the trees there, it's going to probably release it down the road into the ground. But most of the time, um, I guess it depends. It depends on how they decide to get rid of the trees. Will there be a word bank for A-level questions, Surya? So Surya, check out the A-level questions that uh, I shared with you. They're on Google Classroom. Uh, the questions we'll give you, they're in the same exact format as you're seeing them now. So nothing will change about them. Uh, Nidhi, thank you, Nidhi. Viba, which is video or the main video? I watched this video where the main video not recycling. Rhea, Viva, what do you mean by that? By the video you watched that was about not recycling. Shreya, how are decomposers and detritivores different? So Shreya, decomposers are things like uh, worms or bacteria. Like I have a compost, um, what do you call it, bin, I guess. I have a compost bin that I can sort of um, roll and it's constantly turning everything in my, in my compost. So like a lot of my garbage, uh, instead of going into the garbage, it actually goes a lot of my stuff that I don't want like leftover food or like when I chop up vegetables or whatever, if I don't want them, it goes in my compost. I have worms and bacteria in there that basically take all of that organic material and they basically, for lack of a better word, like poop it out, right? And now you have this like rich stuff that you can use as fertilizer uh, in your garden. Detritivores are things like vultures that just try to go after dead things, try to eat uh, dead organisms. Let's see. Viba, apparently it's better to just use reusable containers. Yes, Viba, that is true. That's why I don't like to drink out of plastic water bottles. And I noticed it's changing, actually. Um, like, I remember at Monte Vista when I was teaching, say, even like five, six years ago, I was really having to convince students to not drink water out of reusable, out of um, plastic water bottles. It was something that was like a thing. 
And now I look around the classroom and I would say probably 80, 90% of students have reusable water bottles. It's really awesome. I love that. Is that a reason not to drink from plastic water bottles? Yes, Viba, that is correct. That's that's why I don't like to drink from them because I don't, there's so much that goes into it that we are unaware of that like, I don't know who was wronged along the way. Were, were there native people somewhere who now don't have access to their water because because I'm drinking my out of my plastic water bottle? And the one thing that I hear people say, which honestly, like I, I'm not into it, is when people, people are like, well, the water from plastic water bottles tastes better to me. I don't know. If that's true, awesome, but that's not the case for me. Okay. Um, Uh-oh, Abdullah, you said never mind. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to answer your question. Um, Surya, what is the arrow representing food back? Surya, the arrow is about uh, energy transfer. That's what it represents. Gondar. Yeah, Gondar, my family was super impressed. It was really cool. It was really cool. It's kind of cool, like when you get to show off something you've done to people. I like it. It's like when I was doing pottery, I was so into it, like I would just put my stuff in different places. Like some of the stuff you're seeing seeing in the back, I don't know if you can see it. See that little bowl? See those bowls right there? Those are things that I made. And then on this side, I don't know if you can see that, but the stuff that you see right there, like that stuff, I made that stuff too. So. I like it. I like, you know, when you make something and then people see it and they're like, cool. And you're like, yep, yeah, that was me. I like making stuff, making stuff with my hands. I love art. Okay. Let's get back to work. Where were we? Um, okay. So do you know how does energy flow relate to homeostasis and metabolism? Hmm. Well, you're body is going to take the energy that you're gaining from what you're eating to do metabolism and to do homeostasis and that is considered sort of that 90 percent right so you you get something you eat something how is it that like 90 percent of it is oh that's gone it's not really gone use some of it to do metabolism use some of it to do homeostasis some of it is just given off as heat at the end of it you're left with 10 percent to do what you want with Arjun feedback loop. Arjun, don't worry about that. Um, I can also try to get back to it at the end, but I'm not, I didn't get to food that feedback loops at all with you also. I'm not worried about it and it won't be on your test. Um, what is the difference between global warming and climate change? Shreya, that's a great question. Um, so, okay, so let's talk about this because it's important. So greenhouse effect is something that already exists. It existed before us. It's good. You want it to be there. It makes our planet habitable or inhabitable. Uh, it makes it so that we can live here because it traps. So sunlight comes to our planet. Some of it is absorbed. Some of it tries to leave, tries to leave. I'm using terrible warning. Um, but basically that heat gets trapped and it makes our planet warm, which is a good thing. So unfortunately, as humans, we're releasing so much CO2 and we're making that layer that's able to trap heat for us we're making it thicker so more heat than we want is being trapped which is then causing global warming right and that global warming when the planet heats up that then causes climate change and climate change examples of a drought floods uh shifting up precipitation tsunamis all kinds of stuff so that's muy importante okay Surya, non-point and point source solution. So Surya, non-point uh, source pollution is basically an indirect source of polluting. So if I wash my car in my driveway and that uh, soapy, yucky water goes into the storm drain and eventually finds its way to the estuary, nobody will know that it was me who did it. It was indirect, non-point source. Point source is when you do it and you can like point to who did it and where it was done. John, why should humans care about maintaining biodiversity? Because, John, it can ultimately impact us, actually, too. So we can be super selfish and be like, well, it's not going to do anything to us, so why should I care? But ultimately, it does actually impact us. So ultimately, it, um, it could do lots of things, like think about what we eat. So if biodiversity is decreasing, even things like pollination with bees, if we're losing a lot of them, that means that we're going to lose a lot of our own producers, a lot of our, our, what we like to eat. And that means that since we're top level consumers, anything that happens down here is actually gonna affect us up here. 
Uh, no problem, Abdullah. Yeah, Nidhi, leave whenever you need to. I totally understand. I'll be here a little while longer, so leave whenever. Uh, Ron, I didn't understand the A-level question where it said they were running in a they were running into a drought, but they would have more water due to natural water cycle. I don't know what you mean by that, Ron. I'm going to have to look at that A level again. Yeah. Good night, Abdullah. I hope this was somewhat helpful for you, Surya. Okay, we answered that one. Oh, I backed up a little bit. Um, how does CO2 in the ocean? uh affects shell formation so when you have um lots of co2 that's going to make the water more acidic and that's going to make shell formation uh, not as strong you look at it that way oh karunia you use arg mern for the characteristics of life arg mern sounds good that's cool never thought of that yay thanks gondar i'm happy about my dog too how can we practice scientific argumentation, Dina? How can you practice it? I would say CER. Can we, is there any way that uh, we can find, can we find a way to send Dina or for for a student out there to share our A-level questions with Dina so she can see the CER one that we have? I think that'll be good practice. Karina, it's kind of weird, but it works. That's awesome. That's awesome that it works. Um, Argmern, I like that. Gondor, thank you. Gondar, my dog's names are Kuchuk. Kuchuk is one of them. She's my chocolate lab. And Dakota is my golden retriever. Dakota we got when he was already five years old. Um, he belonged to my wife's father. And when he passed away, we, we uh, adopted Dakota. That's awesome, Karunia. That's awesome about your what you came up with. Shruti, what is the difference between renewable and sustainable? Um, renewable means that you can, you always have it. They're kind of, they're very similar. Renewable means that you can always have it. Sustainable means that it can go on for a long time, forever. Um, Billy, is that you? What are two issues that can occur if water level is depleted? So Billy, in an aquifer, I think that's what you mean. In an aquifer, if water level is depleted, um, it basically could do two things. One, the ground could collapse, the ground above it could collapse. The other thing is if it's near an ocean, the salt water can rush in, which is known as salt water intrusion. And once that happens, now you have brackish water in uh, an aquifer and now it's no use. Now that aquifer is just donezo. Carbon footprint, Surya, is the amount of carbon that um, we use by driving cars, burning fossil fuels, you know, turning the lights on, such things. Saivi, yeah, good question for Karunia. What's the order of your acronym? Viba, how can you track your carbon footprint? So Viba, they're actually websites. I did this in my uh, sheltered class where we uh, got onto a website, I think. Yeah, we got onto this website where you track your um, carbon footprint. Didn't we actually do it in a lot of our classes? Um, there's, there's a little bit of calculations that goes into it. So there's lots of websites out there that can help you with that. All right. Whoop. Scrolling, give me one moment. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Oh man, okay. CFCs, I can come back to that because we didn't cover that. Hi, Arshia. Uh, does physical impact due to global warming include glacier melting and the melting of permafrost? Yeah. Yeah, that could be it for sure. Can you elaborate on biodiversity distribution? Um, all I want you to know, Jenna, about biodiversity is just really try to focus on CHIPO. Just know what what can impact biodiversity. Just uh, focus on that and you'll be okay. Um, Surya, will there be a word bank for the A-level question in the exam? So Surya, like, like I was telling you before, there's everything that you're seeing in there in that um, document that we shared is exactly how it's going to look like on the exam. So I'm sorry if I'm misunderstanding the question, but uh, if you look at it again, it's exactly going to look like that. Billy, without fossil fuels, what is something that can contribute to greenhouse gases? So uh, methane, Billy. Methane can also contribute to greenhouse gases. Uh, oh, except for methane. So there are a number of uh, gases that contribute to, um, they're known as greenhouse gases, but methane and fossil fuels are the only ones we went over. They're the only ones that I really need you to know about. 
So if a vulture is a detritivore, are detritivores the same as scavengers? They could be, yeah. Yeah, John. So mm, I would say that that's kind of a safe thing to assume right now. Nitty, thank you, Nitty. Uh, why is the water bottle harmed? I don't know what you mean, Billy. Come back and ask me that again. So Dina, you said that permafrost was permanently frozen, but doesn't it melt because of the greenhouse effects? What is it? Yeah, so check it out. Um, no, no, the greenhouse effect won't make it won't make permafrost uh, melt. It's it's all the actions that we are we are taking, like all the carbon that we're emitting, that could ultimately uh, really make it bad. So global warming, yeah, that could that could mess it up. But naturally, it should not. It should always stay that way. It should always stay frozen. Thank you, Serena, for your compliment on my pottery. I miss going to pottery, you guys. I really do. I feel like it's something that used to make me really happy going to pottery classes, but it's a it's an investment. It's a time and money investment, and I don't know. It's one of those things I would love to get back into doing. What does DDT do, and what does it mean? DDT, I forget what it stands for, actually, Shreya. Um, I can look it up, but I'm, I'm not worried about you knowing what it uh what it stands for, what it means, but basically it's known as a toxin. Um, it was basically used on uh, crops to make sure that um, it's kind of an in insecticide. And so that's, yeah, that's what it is. Trophic levels, Surya, are basically, when you look at an energy pyramid from each like producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, each of those is a trophic level. Feel, yeah, Gondar, it totally feels good to be able to to make something, especially when, I don't know, it's cool. I just love making stuff. Levels and consumer. Thank you, Serena. You're helping out big time, Billy. So Billy, I want you to think of uh, energy as this, like if a producer has say like 10,000 kilojoules of energy, the primary consumer is gonna get 10% of that really to like usable. So what's 10% of 10,000? So you get 1,000, the secondary consumer, then gets how much of 10,000 or how much of a thousand, 10% of it. So that's a hundred and so on and so forth. No problem, Billy, no problem. Nidhi, you're awesome. What does it mean that plants convert light energy into chemical energy? It basically, yeah, it means the bonds of glucose. You totally got it right, Nika. Nika, I have a Nika in my class too, except the spelling of her name is different. It's with a K. Uh, Billy, logistic means that it just kind of goes like this. I explained it earlier in the uh, video, but it's a graph that eventually starts to kind of level off Ronit, you had a confusion about a level question with atmospheric fluctuation graph so Ronit, that's a great question and i think stefan um is sort of the man when it comes to this one he he and i had a good conversation i hope stefan that was helpful for you but basically it has to do with uh um plants like think about the warm months and the cold months of the year and what that entails. So there's so many plants that are doing photosynthesis versus the cold months that are not. Our planet is breathing, so it's going up and down, up and down. That's what's causing the fluctuations. That's all I can give you because it's an A-level question. Um, Billy exponential means that it's shooting up. Um, what else? Oh, Mr. Jones is in the house. Thanks, Jonesy. I miss you, man. Mr. Jones hasn't been around for three days because um, he was at a teaching conference. And yeah, Jonesy, I got to hear all about your conference and how, how Sacramento has been treating you. All right, let's see. I hope I'm not missing anything. Uh, Gondar, Gondar Kuchuk means little dog. My dad had a dog when I was a kid uh, named Kuchuk, and it's kind of a sad story that goes with it that I'll tell you all sometime. But uh, I knew growing up that I wanted to name my dog Kuchuk. Also, it means it means like a, it's kind of like a slang way of saying little dog or small or little in Farsi or Persian. Dakota, I'm not sure why he was named Dakota. I have no clue. But I call him Coda. I actually make up names for my, do my dogs. I don't know if you all do the same, but like, I don't know if I ever call Kuchuk by her name. I like have all kinds of weird names. Like Jabuli is like one of her nicknames, and Dakota is like Daboda. Anyway, um, 
soteria, combustion of fossil fuels, respiration, decomposition, and deforestation all release carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, decomposition. Decomposition doesn't necessarily release it into the atmosphere. It's actually carbon that's sort of um, staying put in, in the ground. Uh, Jenna, ocean acidification is carbon absorbed and dissolved into the ocean more as it released into the atmosphere more. It's a little bit of both, Jenna, but it really has to do with uh, uh, with CO2 affecting the, the acidity of the water. So think about it in, that, in those terms. Um, Arnav, why doesn't a line reach the graph not go flat when it reaches the carrying capacity? Uh, like, why doesn't it level off and just go flat like that? Hmm, that's a great question. So graphs are so weird in that it depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at populations, you have to think about like, why is it that sometimes the population just goes whoop, or like it drops off? Is it some kind of disease that, that came in or like what was the reason behind it? So um, I think in an, I don't know, I'm gonna have to think about that question a little more. Jonesy, if you're still here, feel free to answer any of these that I can't answer. All right. Run it. Hello, question. Dispute claim. My water. Yeah. So, run it. I did talk about water uh, and the sustainability and how renewable it is. So, back up into this video and you'll find that one. For the fourth leg of the question, why is this as a producer? Ah, Shivali. Shivali, that one I can't help you with uh, as much because it's an A level question. Um, I just want you to. Let me think about what I want to say about it. Okay. So yeah, once carbon is in glucose molecule, what are ways that carbon could take next? So what's in it's in a glucose molecule basically? It's you're you're gonna break up that glucose molecule and you are going to get um, energy out of it, ATP. All right, explain permafrost a little more. Um, I don't know what else to say about permafrost other than what I've said. I mean, I can look up stuff that might be helpful to you all. Um, so a thick Subsurface layer of soil that remains frozen throughout the year, occurring chiefly in polar regions. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, hope that's helpful. Let me see. I don't know where I am. I keep losing my place, you guys. Okay, John, for a level question about someone using a lot of energy. Would we link that energy to being produced at a power plant that burns fossil fuels? You could, yeah, for sure. You could do that. Um, go back to the whole carbon footprint idea. Uh, Karunia are made of cells. Oh, okay, that makes sense, Karunia. Thanks for mentioning that. That's cool. That's good to know. Um, Surya, what is great? So Surya, we never actually got into this, and I'm sorry. I really wanted to, but we didn't have time. Uh, with gray water recycling and rainwater harvesting because I'm excited about that stuff. I love I love talking about that stuff. So I'm actually really bummed out that we didn't talk about it in class. But gray water recycling and is this whole idea that like the water that you're using in your house that's not being used for like toilet use, the gray water that, so like say um, you use water in the shower, that water that's kind of not being used, there's a bucket under there or something, some way of you harvesting or gathering that water and being able to use it for other uses, like watering your plants and stuff. I think it's super cool, but we didn't have a chance to talk about it, so I didn't put it on the test for our test. Other teachers may have put it on there depending on whether they focus on it or not. Um, oh no, I lost my place again. Okay, bye Nidhi. Yes, Gondar, thank you for, man, okay, so dichloro, diphenyl, trichloroethane. Yup, that sounds right. Billy, why is water bottle bad for us? The water bottle is not bad for you itself, Billy. It's just the process of making it and how much water it's used to make it and and uh, and where the water is coming from. And yes, thank you, Serena. I did explain it earlier, according to Google. Thanks, Gondar. You are, uh, you are, Actually, a pretty awesome sort of semi mod for me right now. To Dina, what factors does having to change in a population? So, Dina, you're talking about um, emigration, which is uh, when organisms leave an environment, immigration, which is when they come into an environment, birth rate, and death rate. Those are things that affect the, the size of a population. I hope that answers your question. 
Um, why do populations fluctuate around their carrying capacity? Oh, that's a great question. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to that. You're asking a really good one that I'm gonna have to learn more about. Why do populations? I'm gonna so Dina, I'm gonna look that one up and try to get back to you. Mm, you know what I can do too. Some of the questions that uh, so you're asking me that I'm not able to answer right now, either because I didn't cover it or because I wanted to learn more about it and tell you, I can create um, something later and put it on Google Classroom. And those of you who are not in my class, hopefully you have someone in my class that can share it with you. All right. Gianti, what type of ecosystem? Yeah, it's an estuary. So sort of a marine estuary, if I get it that way. Soft one, can the ocean absorb methane or is it only carbon? Soft one, from what I understand, it's only carbon. It's not methane because methane doesn't mix with water. Gondor, I love their names. Oh, thanks, Gondor. Simba, that sounds like an awesome name. Uh, I will tell you this. When I give Dakota a haircut, uh, I cut his hair so that he looks like a lion. So like his tail is actually like poofy <laughs> at the end of it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, no problem, Soteria. Thank you for being so awesome and saying thank you. Explain why the carbon emissions fluctuate throughout the year, Shriya. Um, yeah, so Shriya, it has to do with uh, with plants. So it's, I'll go over it, I guess. Hmm. Let me think about how I want to say it. It has to do with the amount of photosynthesis that takes place on the planet as a whole throughout the year. So think about how we have uh, winter and fall where we don't have as much photosynthesis, whereas spring and summer where we do. And that'll guide you the right direction. Mr. Jones, yes, Mr. Jones coming in with the info. Populations fluctuate around their carrying capacity because it's not realistic for an environment to remain the same all the time. So the carrying capacity can change from year to year. Thank you, Jonesy. I appreciate your help. Dina. Whoa, Dina coming in with the info. If there are too many primary consumers and the producer, the equilibrium or the balance of the nature will be gone. All right. Bye, Surya. Um, John, are immigration and birth rate limiting factors? No, I wouldn't say they're limiting factors. I wouldn't I wouldn't call them that. Um what is cap and trade? Alex, I explained uh, cap and trade. I think it was the first thing I talked about. Uh, in this video, so back it all the way up. And then Ronit mentioned that there's actually a way to back things up or back up the video so that you can get to a place where I talked about it. So try that. Ronit, I'm going to have you teach me that in person sometime because I want to know how to do that. Because a lot of times I'll watch like a Jones video or I don't know, recently Ms. Chow has, has started doing them too. And when I watch those, I want to be able to back up and see you know what they talked about because it's really helpful to me. I feel like as bio teachers and Jones, if you're still here, you can chime in. I, I feel like I don't know everything. Like watching my colleagues uh, teach is, is actually really entertaining for me because I don't know, it's it's cool. It's really cool to me. I'm such a science like bio nerd that I love learning more about this stuff. And I don't, I don't have the expectation of myself to be like a guru that knows all this stuff. So, so I appreciate your patience and with me and trying to learn new stuff. What does it mean when the water level is depleted and what issue does it cause with an aquifer? So SIV, it basically means that we took so much water out of the aquifer that the water table has dropped. So the level, the amount of water that we had in there, so that's in the aquifer, the amount of water has gone down. So think of this as your aquifer. This is my glass of carrot juice. So if the water drops so much, now you have this gap, you have this airspace and you have the ground above it, and that ground above it, because there's nothing in between, could actually collapse. Cool. I think that's what you're referring to. All right. Let's see, Run it. What is Mrs. Chow's channel? I heard she was... Yeah, I think she's streaming tomorrow. I'm going to try to share with you a document where we all talk about when we're streaming. So I think that um, she's doing it tomorrow. So and I, I know she would love to have all of you there. Manvi, what are the two? I hope I'm saying your name right, Manvi. What are the two ways water can be delivered to a household? <clears throat> so Manvi, in some houses, it's possible that if you have a aquifer, that you can basically dig a well and the water comes to your house that way. Another way is if you're getting it from a reservoir, and that reservoir, typically the water is going to go to a, a water treatment plant before it comes to your house. <laughs> Jones, you know everything. <laughs> this is true, Jones. 
This is true. You do know everything. Uh, Gondar. I think it means that there is a lot less groundwater, which means there's also a shorter water supply. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think we're talking about the same thing. I'm not 100% sure. But list your question for me again, and I can try to figure it out. John, the top corner of the chat has three dots. True. When pressed, you can press toggle timestamps. So, John, my question is, who is timestamping it all? I'm such a, I don't know enough about this stuff. I need to learn more. Interesting. So is that what I do? Like, am I the one who timestamps it? Or can you all do that? Or is this something that Nidhi does? I have no idea. No problem, Saivi. Abhishek, what does salinity mean? Abhishek, salinity is uh, like the amount of salt that, are, that there is in water. So brackish water is water that's a mix of salt and fresh water. Gondar, Wednesday. Oh, Gondar, you have it. You were amazing. Uh, Wednesday, you got me, Jones. Hey, Jones is coming up in like 40 minutes. All right, Jonesy. You get to follow this show. Ciao is uh, Thursday, 7 to 8. Learner is 8 to 9. All right. Thank you very much for sharing that. That is awesome. Okay. Mm, Dina. What is Earth Overshoot Day? I'm going to try to look that up. Jonesy, what is Earth Overshoot Day? Jones, I have no idea if you're here, but I'm, I'm pretending like you are. Known as Ecological Debt Day, is calculated illustrative calendar date on which humanity's resource consumption for the year exceeds the Earth's capacity to regenerate those resources that year. Interesting. Here, I'm going to do a straight up copy paste. That you can see what I just read. Okay. Maybe, uh, so, um, yeah, seriously, thank you, Ronit, for thanking Gondar. It's for you guys to do. Uh, hey, I'm trying to stop saying you guys, by the way. I don't know if my students have actually noticed this in class, but I'm trying to avoid using guys because it's not as inclusive. So I've replaced it with my TAs with comrades. <laughs> so not you guys. Okay. Oh, it automatically time stamps. Time stamps. Yeah. John, when you post something, okay. Oh, okay. I need to be better with technology. Technology and I are not great friends. We need to be better friends. I'm I'm seeking a stronger relationship with technology. Oh, okay, okay. Good stuff that you're teaching me. Yeah, Billy, you are totally right. Uh, um, good amount, a large amount of biodiversity means the ecosystem is going to be stronger. Jenna, uh, with ocean acidification, is carbon absorbed and dissolved into the ocean more? Or is it released into the atmosphere more? Uh, we're with ocean acidification. We're really talking about the water, just having that CO two, having that carbon in it, so the carbonic acid. Um, and if in a situation where the ocean is going to have more carbon, eventually there's going to be exchange with the atmosphere. So yeah, it is going to go to the atmosphere too. Um, Jonesy, Jonesy, you need my help with groceries. Jonesy, I am so happy to help you. The problem is I'm taking off uh, to go see Raphael tomorrow in North Carolina. And I'll be back super late Sunday night, which reminds me, Jones, I actually might ask you if I can come and have another sleepover Sunday night because I'm getting back super late from my uh, from my flight. I think we land at like 1020 and I probably, yeah, by the time I get home, it'd be super late. So I'm going to hit you up and see if I can come spend the night Sunday night, possibly, possibly, but it might be late. So I don't know, but I'm happy to help you tell just whatever you need. Uh, what are the sources of water pollution? How does pollution enter the waterways, Dina? Okay, Dina, so lots of different ways, actually. Lots of different ways. So uh, one of them is basically like polluting, like stuff going into storm drains. That's the one that we focused on with uh, non-point source pollution. So when you do that, when water goes into storm drains, it could lead to the SF estuary eventually, and it could actually damage a lot of uh, organisms there. So that's what I focus on in my class mostly. Serena, if they're called uh, comrades, are the students referred to? <laughs> oh, man, that is awesome. <laughs> Serena, you are legit. Serena, whose class are you in? Who's your teacher? Uh, Shuti, what are some impacts of climate change on biodiversity? Oh, Shuti, so 
you're talking about Chippo. And remember, uh, Shruti, you're not my student, so I can't say remember. But in class, we talked about how a lot of videos that you're going to watch on uh, biodiversity don't really refer to Chippo as Chippo. They refer to it as Hippo because climate change is a sort of a recent thing, kind of, that was added. Um, and at Monta Vista, all of us teachers really focus on that. Um, sorry. Got distracted by a comment that I left, and now I don't. Oh, it's too many words. That's why I can't add it. Oh, hold on one sec. Hold on one second. I'll come back to that. There we go. Okay. Um, where was I? Yeah, so climate change is going to do things like it's going to uh, cause droughts and flooding and all that. And when you think about all those, all those things, as little as they may seem, they're actually killing a lot of organisms in that area. Elaborate on energy pyramids. Okay, so Ron, I explained this a little earlier, so go back and you will find it. Dina, have humans altered the carbon cycle? So Dina, we're basically, I uh, explained this as well, so you might have to go back and check it out, but we're basically taking carbon uh, out of the slow cycle, the geological cycle, and pushing it into the fast cycle, and the fast cycle can't keep up with it, so it's creating a thicker layer of, um, that's, layer of gases that is making our planet warmer. That's my sort of quick and basic explanation. Thank you, Jonesy, I appreciate it, but it might be late, so. Yeah, like I said, we're getting back at 10, 1020 is when our flight lands, and then we're getting picked up uh, by Riccio's wife, and I'm gonna park my car actually at, at their place tomorrow morning, so. By the time we get to his place, it'll probably be like 11. By the time I get to your place, it'll be super late, like almost midnight. So I might not bother you with it. Thank you, Gondar. Okay, so check it out, Gondar. I'm gonna uh, help with this one too. So I, I see that you wrote it's lost as heat. So I wanna be super picky about using the word lost as heat because energy is not really lost. Energy is transferred uh, from sort of like one form, one place to another. So you can say it is given off to the surroundings, to the environment as heat, but just kind of be careful about using the word lost as heat. Serena, you're a Miss Chow student. That is awesome. You have a fantastic teacher. I feel that way about all my biology colleagues though. Saivi, so what is the other way besides a sewage system and a septic tank that water can leave a household? Um, there is no other way, Saivi. I have a septic tank in my house. And if I didn't, then it would be a sewage system. I don't know of any other way. I think those are the only two ways. Yeah. Gondar, 10% is passed on to the next level. Uh, yes, Gondar. So 90% is used for things like metabolism, cell respiration, which is metabolism, uh, homeostasis. 90% um, is used for all of that and given off as heat. Uh, and 10% is basically left to be used for whatever else. Uh, Billy, cutting trees will make climate, will cause climate change. Yeah, because cutting trees, I mean, think about you're doing, number one, if you're burning them, you're releasing a lot of carbon, a lot of CO2. And two, uh, trees are going to be sort of a place where they're going to absorb a lot of CO2. So if you're cutting them out of the equation, then you're, you're it's kind of a double whammy. Nice, thank you, Serena, for responding. I have like legit mods in here such as Serena and Gondar, who are helping me out. I appreciate it very much. All right. Run it, bigger concern for our planet, the amount of people or the amount of resources they use. The bigger concern, in my opinion, is resources, it's not people. Because remember, yeah, people, that's a big deal. But the issue with having more people is that we, we need more to live, to survive. Uh, and so we need more resources. So I guess it's kind of like a, it's they're both problems. So Terry, uh, let's see. Thank you, Gondar. Drought. Something else I'm learning is like someone says something and then it says message retracted. What is that about? Why is that happening? Like why, first of all, why is the message being retracted? Why would somebody retract a message? Rhea, Rhea, you're awesome by the way. Thanks for all the amazing questions you ask in class. What is the difference between man-made water cycle and natural water cycle? So the difference is that man-made water, mm, it has to do with all the stuff that we do. So think about waterways, the water flow chart. 
and all the places that we direct water to go, you know, to come to our houses and then leave our house and go to a sewage system, then go here, then go there. That's all man-made. The way we collect water, natural water cycle is stuff that happens regardless of whether we're around or not. So precipitation, condensation, evaporation, transpiration. Uh, Billy, what things make the egg smaller? Do you mean the eggshells we're talking about? If that's what you're talking about, then I think you're referring to the amount of CO2 that uh, gets in the way of that eggshell being tougher. Jasmita, aqueducts and reservoirs are both man-made, right? Yes. Yes, they are. Rhea with the smiley faces. Rhea is awesome. Soteria, DDT can make the egg. Yes, thank you, Soteria, for helping out. I appreciate that. Jayanti, Jayanti, who's your teacher? Two issues that can occur as an aquifer. Jayanti, I, I covered this one. Um, ground collapsing and salt water intrusion. Uh, back it up and you'll be able to see me explain it in further detail. Gondar. You think they might type something? That's not clear. Oh, really? Okay. Does that mean I could do that too? Type something and then retract it? Can I do that in class? Like say something and then retract? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Oh, Ron, it means to delete the message. The user thinks it's not needed in the chat. Oh, okay. Good to know. What kind of life does ocean acidification mainly affect? Um, all the aquatic organisms, mostly, Jenna. Correct me if I'm wrong, Shreya, uh, but the sum of both greenhouse gas effect and the burning of fossil fuels leads to global warming. Yes. Yes, you are right. Yes, and that leads to climate change. <clears throat> yeah. Now, remember, that's that's not detailed at all, but that's okay. I think... We both know what you, where you're going with that, and that's good. Yeah, it's a kind of simple way of putting it, but then be able to, you should be able to definitely explain in further detail. Nika, Nika, who's your bio teacher? Um, is a virus biotic? No, a virus is considered abiotic. Mm. Let's see, I thought it was only once it's taken over a cell. No, so, so Nika, what I want you to do is, um, See if you can apply the eight characteristics of life to a virus and see which ones apply and which ones don't. Um, and you'll see that a lot of them actually don't. So to scientists, viruses are considered abiotic. Uh, John, why doesn't DDT make the eggshell? Why doesn't DDT make the eggshell thinner? Uh, yeah, yeah, DDT could do that too, totally. Do plants also undergo respiration? Yes, we have plants also do cell respiration. That is actually part of our uh, next unit. This The latter part of our next unit is all about that. Yeah, Gondar, I can do it too. I can retract. Bye, Karunia. No problem. Thank you for saying thank you. Um, uh oh. What was that? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, everyone would remember that. This is true. Aquifer. Arshia, cool. Thank you, Arshia, for helping. No problem, Jenna. Soteria, no problem. Thank you for saying thanks to John. Nika, you're a Mr. Gan student. All right. Did I meet you, Nika, when I subbed for Mr. Gan? Were you in one of those classes? I subbed for fifth period today and seventh period yesterday. How can we help reduce ocean acidification, uh, Dina? By basically doing a lot less of the crap that we're doing. Um, so again, it goes back to sort of CO2, like there's so much of it that the ocean is actually absorbing a lot of it. Uh, and we just need to get better, I think, especially with your generation, because it's just been so bad. And I think that uh, money just kind of becomes more important than environment to a lot of these corporations and to a lot of these people who, who are getting rich off of it. But that's a whole other conversation. Um <clears throat> Ria, why is the carbon cycle different throughout parts of the year? Okay, Ria, I covered this one uh, a little bit ago, so back it up and you'll see. It has to do with photosynthesis being taken, photosynthesis taking place during different parts of the year, and that has to do with the uh, um, amount of plants or leaves that exist that time of year. Climate science, Dina is all about basically studying climate change. Oh, Nika, you have bio second. Got it. So I didn't meet you. Cool. I would love to meet you all in person. Those of you who I have not met before in person, I would love for you to come in and say hi sometime. Yep, you're totally right, Gabriella. Gabriella Morali, you have an older sister, I think, right? Who was an avid tutor, I believe, who I worked with. Thank you, John. 
Um, yes, Gabriella, you're right. Gabriella, do you go by Gabriella or by Gabby? Dina, how can we decrease carbon emissions and stabilize the greenhouse gases? So Dina, it goes back to like, we just need to, like cap and trade is one of them. It's the first thing I talked about in this video. Uh, we need to find ways for, um, for the big polluters to just kind of like limit the amount of uh, pollution, CO2 pollution that there is. You know, stuff like walking more, driving less. Yeah, that, that definitely makes it better, but we need to really go at the at the big dogs when it comes to this one. All right. Currently considered about it. Okay, yep, you are right, Ashia. Shreya, you're Mr. Ganser. So Shreya, I met you today then. All right. When they ask us where is water come to help water come to they mean how is it in California and the water flow chart? Um, it depends on the question, Saivi. It depends on like where we're going with that question. So I'm not sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we met today. That's awesome. I'm glad, happy to have met you. We're waiting for more evidence. Yep, yep, you're right, John. All right. I love how you're helping each other out with this. This is really fun for me to read. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna go for maybe five more minutes. Um and then I'm gonna go pack for my trip tomorrow, which I'm excited about. I'm excited about seeing my my buddies and having a few days and in a different place that I've never been. I don't know anything about North Carolina, you guys. Not you guys, you comrades. I don't know anything about North Carolina. I I hear that it's beautiful, but we'll see. As soon as I land, I'm actually gonna go. Um, I my buddies and I were gonna go watch a U.S. women's uh, national team game, soccer game. They're playing Mexico, so I'm super excited about that one too. Billy, the arrows on the food web represent where energy is going. Thanks, Gondar. I'm excited for my trip. Yeah. All right. Looks like Gabriella. Gabby, you go by Gabby. So you're old. So I have worked with your older sister, and she was awesome. And I'm sure you are too. Gabby, you should come in and meet me sometime. I would love to meet you. Ronit, no, I'm actually not coming to class tomorrow. I'm leaving tomorrow morning super early. My uh, I'm leaving my house at 5. The flight is out of SFO at 10. So I will not be seeing you tomorrow. Ms. Uh, Detmer will be subbing tomorrow. Thanks, Jonesy. Yeah, start your stream. Have fun. Uh, anybody who's here and you're wanting to do more bio because bio is amazing, hop over to Mr. Jones's uh, video lecture, not video lecture, his uh, live stream. He is, as you all know, an amazing teacher. And we're all lucky to have him. Yep, John, you are totally right. It is sad. Yep, I totally agree with you, John. Sivy, thanks, Ivy. Chemical energy and what's related to so soteria, chemical energy. What we're really talking about is uh, glucose. When you break glucose, you're releasing chemical energy. I think really that's all you need to know. Thanks, Ronit. Appreciate it. Yeah, Serena, you, me, and John would like, we would, we would sit down and have an amazing conversation about climate change because <laughs> I, I sense the passion in what you're writing, like how frustrating it is that we're the only country that pulled out of it. I'm totally with you. No problem, Shreya. Thanks for being here. Have a good night. No problem, Jasmita. Shreya, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Run it. Uh, if you can review climate change, a level questions and the study guide. To, I think so. Just, you know, go over your notes, go over the study packet, the review packet I gave you, um, go over the A level questions we gave you. Um, yeah, I think, I think so. Yay, John, talking about climate change. So here's the thing, though, John, what's interesting is that a lot of students are. Some students love the unit that we're in right now. And then there are students who are just like, I'm not about it. I'm really not enjoying it. And they usually tell me this after, after they're done with bio or like throughout, like later throughout the year. Um, so I was sitting with a couple of students uh, yesterday and one of them was like, I loved uh, when we talked about ecology. And the other one was like, I hated ecology. So it's so interesting. It's just kind of different people's uh, preferences. No problem, Jasmita, Shriya. Yeah, thank you, Shriya. Um, thanks, Arnav. I totally agree, Gondar. I am totally with you. Bye, Arnav. I'll see you next week. Safwan, thank you, my friend. Thank you for being here. 
John, no problem. Appreciate the well wishes. Yeah, no problem, Arshia. Arshia, I would love to meet you in person too if I haven't already done so. Yep, Gondar, Gondar, now we're talking. <laughs> oh man, I don't want to get all political on here, but I'm with you. Uh, mitigation and adaptation. Gabby, we didn't, in my class, I didn't do, you know what I'll do? I'll put this, I didn't talk about mitigation and adaptation, um, and I need to learn more about it myself. So I am going to look that up and then I'll create a document um, for those of you who need further help. I just, you know what sucks? There's no way for me to like create something and send it out to all bio kids because I, I can only send it to my students. So hopefully my students can share it with everybody else. All right. Ronan, I talked about biomag and bioaccumulation earlier. So back it up and you'll be able to find it. Yeah, John, I'm with you. John, you know what's crazy is there's there are parts of the country where um, they actually don't want teachers to teach some of this stuff, like global warming and climate change, because they call it a hoax. Insane, but yeah. Thank you, Billy. So, Terria, you're so awesome for thanking everybody. That's really cool of you. Bye, Saivi. You should send it to the other teachers and they can send it to the... Yeah, I guess I could do that, Gondar. I just, yeah, I didn't think about that. Good point. I don't know if they'd want to send it to their students. I don't want to pressure them into sending it to their students. I wonder, I want, you know, it'd be cool if I had some kind of website where I could just post it on there and all students could go and see my stuff. I wonder if that's a possibility. I don't know. I don't even know how to begin that, but if someone out there knows how to do it, I would love your help. Maybe, maybe that's the way we go. Um, what time does Mr. Jones start his Surya? I think he's starting at eight. So he was talking about how he's going to go set up for his right now. Um, carbon sink. I'm gonna explain that to Dina. I'm gonna include that in everything that I'm gonna send you all. And by say, by saying you all, I mean just my students, and then they can send it to everybody else. Yeah, I agree, John. I'm with you. I get frustrated when I think about the politics of it. Hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean, Ron. It. I just, I don't know if that's a possibility. Yeah, Gondor, I think you're right. I forget I forget a lot of it, but yeah, you're right. I mean, one of the things I'll share with you since we're ending, let's see, Monvi Google Classroom for all bio students. I guess. Yeah, Monvi, I, I guess. You know what I worry about? I worry about sort of overstepping and because I want, I want to allow every teacher to have that relationship with their students and to send out what they want and stuff. And I don't want to sort of like um, hog the whole thing by being like, hey, you know, come to me. I'll, I have all the info because I don't have all the info. <clears throat> yeah, Gabby, I can I can put that in there about carbon sink too, just so everybody sees it. Sivy, trophic devils, primary, secondary. Two. Yeah, yeah, Sivy, you're totally right. Sivy, it was very nice meeting you today, by the way. Um, okay, yep, you're right. Alrighty, well, Thank you everybody for joining me for this. This has been fun. Um, I'm really, really thankful that I have such incredible uh, students and people such as yourselves to join me for some things. It's uh, it's a pretty awesome feeling, I will tell you that, to be a teacher, uh, to get to work with students who care so much about their education and who are just good human beings. So thank you all for being yourselves. All right, I am going to make myself some dinner, pack, I'm going to eat some uh, dried mango. If you haven't tried this stuff from Costco, it is amazing. I highly recommend it. Kind of pricey, but really good. Thank you all. You are all amazing. I appreciate every single one of you, even the ones who I haven't met, uh, who I hope to meet. Hope everybody has a good night and see you next week.